I would like to move forward into the event now and bring forth uh, Kathy Nesberg, who's going to introduce State Senator and Senate President John Cullerton, who will deliver our first keynote. But before I do, I want to tell you why I'm excited about this event. We have held a number of fiscal symposia over the years. And the easiest thing to do at any major public policy symposium, particularly the one that focuses on taxes and budgets, is to complain about the problems. It's very easy to complain about the taxes you pay. It's very easy to complain about the lack of funding for schools or for health care or for caring for the developmentally disabled, et cetera. What's difficult always is solving those problems. Now, we at the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability believe that there are some very clear solutions available. They just haven't taken root yet. The reason I'm excited about today's presenters is you have leaders, every single one of them, who have distinguished themselves by being willing to take bold stands to actually solve problems moving forward. And I have a very strong and very real hope that the individuals that are going to present to you today will be part of the solution not just part of the complaining. And we should start moving that way as voters and taxpayers. We should start insisting that other members of the General Assembly, other constitutional officers, join the bold leaders that we have in this room today and finally move our state forward. So on that positive note, because there will be plenty of doom and gloom, I'm inviting Kathy Nesberg up here to introduce Senate President John Cullerton. Kathy? Thank you all for coming. Um, I've got two jobs. One is as part of the CTBA's Symposium Committee. And we're, uh, on behalf of the committee, we're very glad to see you today. Um, I would like committee members to stand so we can thank them. Bill Barclay, Dave Bonnet, Peggy Cochran, Todd Dieterle, Congressman Woman Robin Kelly, who's in DC today, was also helpful. Jim Morley, uh, students Jenna Palladino and Matt Vogler, volunteer Stephanie Follett, and most thanks of all to our tireless chairwoman, uh, Jean Sussman, who was not able to be with us today. So thank you all for the to the committee. I now have the. Uh, I get to introduce Senator John Cullerton. John has served in the in Illinois General Assembly for more than three decades, but John and I go back way farther than that. We were high school classmates at St. Francis High School in Wheaton, Illinois, and even then, he knew he would go into politics, and his classmates knew it too. <laughs> uh, John went on to receive both his undergraduate and law degrees from Loyola University, and after law school, he began his public service career as an assistant public defender in Chicago. In 1978, he was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives. Throughout his six-term career in the House, he served as the Speaker Pro Tem and the Democratic Floor Le Leader. He was appointed to the Illinois Senate in January 1991, and a year later, he won election to the Senate, representing the state's eighth, sixth legislative district. In 2009, John was elected to stir, serve as state Senate president. On his first day in office, he began a Senate impeachment trial that ultimately led to the removal of a sitting governor. He has distinguished himself as a leader in, on statewide smoking ban to promote healthy environments. A keen, he's a keen negotiator and a legislator who seeks bipartisan compromise to achieve the best policy outcomes. He presides over the largest Senate caucus in America and the largest Senate Democratic caucus in the history of Illinois. John is also a partner at the Chicago law firm of Thompson Colburn LLP. He and his wife Pamela live in Chicago and have five children. Following his presentation, John will take questions for 10 minutes. So please join me in welcoming Illinois State Senate Pres President John Cullerton.
Thank you very much, Kathy. Kathy and I, whenever we see each other, we acknowledge that we cannot lie about our ages because we, we went to high school together. Um, and I've known Ralph for quite some time, and I'm very appreciative of the invitation. Uh, however, um, speaking to this crowd is a little bit more intimidating than, uh, than normal because normally when I do a PowerPoint about the Illinois budget, uh, most people have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Because they would get their information from the Chicago-based news media, which does not uh, primarily, you know, cover Springfield, much less the state budget. And <clears throat> when you go to other uh, media markets throughout the state, it's quite the opposite. Everybody knows who their state senator is, they know who their state representatives are, and, they, and the, the state budget is much more a part of their economy, and as a result, people are more knowledgeable. Uh, but when we talk about our budget, most people have no idea. And so um, my wife actually is the one that got me, um, she said, I used to talk about the budget, and she'd say, well, you know, you got to do PowerPoints because nobody's going to be paying attention to you, so we, you got to have pie charts. She's really big into pie charts. So we will have some pie charts for you folks if you'd like. Um, the other thing that is uh, interesting, uh, is that uh, I was in this, uh, the state capitol in the legislature for 30 years before I became the president of the Senate. And typically, just like the, the, the uh, people that live in the Chicago media market, the legislators aren't as informed about the budget unless they happen to be on an appropriations committee. So the, I'm talking about the Chicago area legislators. So I, quite frankly, never really had to focus on the budget other than, you know, some, some uh, things that were particularly interested, interesting or of, of a nature to our district, but not the, the, the general state budget. Um, and Kristen Richards, who's my uh, budget policy person, had to sit down and kind of educate me, and I would say I know about a third of what I should. Uh, and therefore, there's people here who know more than I do, so it's kind of embarrassing to have to try to give a speech when you know more than I do. But we will, we will, we will start and try to do what I can. I think in order to talk about what we did this last week, it's better to talk about what we did, and what we were confronting in the beginning of last year. So the fiscal year 13 budget, um, which was a year ago, uh, reduced appropriations for general state aid for early childhood and other education priorities. And it was a very difficult budget to pass as a result of that. Keep in mind, uh, our caucus, did, we did not have 40 people uh, in our caucus then, we had 35. We have 10 African Americans, we have four Hispanics, we have, uh, I think, eight downstaters, we have uh, folks from the suburbs, we have the most diverse caucus. And to get folks to reduce appropriations for school, early childhood, and, and uh, higher ed is not easy. Uh, at the same time, we passed major changes to the Medicaid program. Uh, called the SMART Act, and that involved the only, the, the only fun part for me was raising the cigarette tax, because I like to raise the cigarette tax, because I don't smoke, for number one, and number two, we know it saves an enormous amount of money, and it keeps people, uh, young kids, from starting, and, uh, uh, and saves lives. That was part of the Medicaid uh, package, but it involves some uh, tough votes. And, uh, and of course, at the outset of the fiscal year, um, you know, we have certain parts of our budget, which we'll talk about later, that, that are driven by a formula. And so they're liabilities. They're, they're there. And just because you don't authorize enough spending to pay them doesn't mean that you've cut the budget. It means you're creating old bills. And so that's what we were confronted with uh, last year. Uh, and, and there were certain human service pro programs uh, community care uh, programs, for example, or our own state uh, uh, group health insurance program, where we are just had not been appropriating enough money. Um, we also had, of course, the pension, the growth in the pension. Uh, every year, it seems like it's almost a billion dollars that increases. That's why we've been focusing on pension reform, uh, because it's been crowding out other areas of state spending. You know. The, the ironic thing about the pensions is that the pension fund is not going bankrupt. We're honest, we, we have a law that we're following that 
puts money into the pension fund every year. There's a certified amount. It's a continuing appropriation. Uh, and it's going to get in there, and the, the pension system, if nothing changes, is going to be 90 percent funded by 2045. The problem is not the pension system. It's what's left over for the rest of the budget. And that's the crowding out that everybody is aware of. Um, we, I mentioned the state group health insurance benefits. We knew that there was a contract that was being ne negotiated uh, by the governor and, uh, and the various unions representing state employees. And we had a, a law on the books that we had to repeal. It was Senate Bill 1313, and that dealt with kind of a, uh, a guarantee of certain health care benefits that uh, we, had, we had put in the law, which we wanted to uh, remove from the law and allow for uh, the union negotiators and the governor to negotiate, and that was done. So, um, we, and also a year ago, we didn't um, know, we had a modest idea of how much our revenues were going to be. After all, when you do a budget, you're only, you know, making educated guesses as, out of how much money you're going to have in the future. So we had an April surprise this year. We didn't anticipate that back in, uh, in 20, a year ago. So um, just last week, we were finishing up the end of the fiscal year 13 uh, budget. Um, and the April surprise was about $1.2 billion that came in uh, as a result of the federal uh, fiscal cliff and forced folks to um, sell some assets at the end of the last year, and it resulted in us having a, a, a big increase in revenues. So we then did supplemental, uh, fiscal year 13 supplemental appropriations, uh, over 1.2 billion, and what we did was to pay down old bills. That's what we did with the money. So the, the uh, CCP program, Medicaid, um, and even, uh, you know, governments that we owed money to uh, got paid faster. So uh, GAMBI estimates we will end fiscal year 13 with over 2.3 billion less on hand, le less bills on hand, something that you would not read in a Tribune editorial. Um, fiscal year 14, um, we had some pressures. So the pension cost went up again. Uh, I think it was $900 million in general revenue fund. The um, GRF payment is 17% of the, t of the budget. And remember, we had to uh, borrow for those two horrendous years, the worst years in the history of the states in terms of our income during the, uh, uh, tr the uh, recession. Uh, we had to borrow to pay, make our pension payments. Probably a pretty good idea to borrow at low interest rates. The stock market has more than doubled since we did that. Um, but we're, we're in the midst of paying off those old uh, bills, uh, those, that, that, that old borrowing. So when you, when you look at and combine the two, the pension benefit, uh, the pension obligation plus those bonds is 22% of our budget. Um, now our goal, at the Senate Democrats, when we started our budget negotiations, uh, was to first look and see, you know, you start with what the governor proposes. And to be fair, the governor, he didn't know the April surprise was coming when he proposed this budget. Um, so we had wanted to um, increase state aid uh, by $150 million. Um, and that's so that we can get back to the same percentage uh, of the foundation level that, that, that we had been at the previous year. Um, we also had a, a lot of folks in, in the state senate care about this, the school transportation line item, and that was had been cut, so we wanted to reinstate that. And higher ed uh, has been one that's been suffering from this crowding out for years. As a result, there's been tuition increases, as folks know, and the governor's budget had started off with four to four and a half to five percent uh, cuts. So. Um, Again, our goals involve maintaining the 89% proration uh, of the foundation level, uh, trying to hold the line on the school transportation funding level and early childhood funding, uh, and fully fund social service programs at their estimated liability. In other words, don't create any new old bills. So we get to Pam Cullerton's pie chart. Uh, 
This is our fiscal year 14 general revenue funds by source. This is where we get the money from. This is note, uh, worth, uh, it's worth noting, of course, that the personal income tax is 45%. Um, the corporate is 8%. I think when that was, when the largest income tax in the history of the state of Illinois was passed in 1970, uh, the percentage of corporate was about 20%. Uh, you see the sales tax, keep in mind that in Illinois, uh, the sales tax is 21% of the total. Uh, it's worth noting that we are one of the states that we have very few sales taxes on services. So virtually all the states, it's, every state has sales tax on services much more than we do. The other sources of revenue would be utility taxes or gaming or cigarettes. Uh, that's that 15%. And the federal receipts are the, uh, the uh, Medicaid matching dollars. And the total's over on the right there. Now, that's where we get the money from. I have to kind of add this. When we talked about the income tax and how much we get from the personal income tax, it's good, I think, to compare our income tax to other states in the Midwest. Let's see, the first one is, is that Iowa? You see it's graduated, but you can see real quickly it gets up to 9%. Then we have Scott Walker, that would be Wisconsin, the guy that wanted us to move to Wisconsin because we raised our income tax to 5%. He's quickly at uh, six and a half and then up to eight. Uh, Missouri, that's a flat 6%. When we debated the uh, Missouri, when we debated our Illinois income tax, uh, one of the senators said, uh, I had represented that Missouri was a one percentage point higher than us. And he said, that's not true. Missouri's got a graduated tax. If you can see, it starts down there at like one percent. It's only if you make more than $10,000 a year <laughs> that you have to pay 6%. So I conceded that I was wrong. So that's Missouri, and, and the reason why I mention Missouri is because my law firm is based in Missouri, so I pay Missouri income taxes, and it's higher than Illinois. Okay, the next one is uh, Kentucky, just about the same. And there's Illinois, 5% flat. And then we have the great state of Indiana, which we get compared to a lot. Now Indiana has a tax rate that includes the average county tax rate of 1.28%. So when folks say that Indiana is 3.5% and we're 5, they forget that Indiana has uh, this county. In fact, some counties are actually higher than Illinois, and they tax retirement income, which we don't, and they have sales taxes on services. So if anybody tells you Indiana's got lower taxes, not so much. And then that's what we're going back down to. So on January 1st, 2015, you can all celebrate because we're going to be at 3.75%. So next, that's about $5 billion difference between the two red lines. So next year when people are running for governor, I'm not running for governor, but when the people who are running for governor are running, you might want to ask them about that gap. That's that $5 billion difference when the income tax comes down. And it happens by operation of law, okay? It's not, quote, temporary as Mike Flannery likes to say. We'd have to pass a law to make it go up, okay? And we've done that before. Uh, we, we did that, remember when Governor Edgar ran against uh, Attorney General Hardigan? The irony was that the Republicans said, I think we should keep it at the higher level, and he won the election, and we had to go in and vote to raise it, if you will, from what otherwise would have been, two and a half percent, up to three. So if we're gonna change that 3.75, it's gonna to have to be someone voting to raise the tax because otherwise it goes down by operation of law. Now, the corporate tax rates, uh, you can see we're at 7%. And um, that also is going to go back down on, on uh, January 1st. I think it's just under 6%. Now, the, the reason why I put this up is that this is kind of a uh, apples to apples argument that I think is worth noting. Whenever you read in the, um, uh, a lot of publications, they will say that Illinois' corporate income tax is 9.5% uh, because they add the 2.5%, which is the corporate personal property replacement tax. I say replacement tax because we don't have a personal property tax. 
Okay? If we had a personal property tax, we wouldn't have to have a personal property replacement tax. So apples to apples, this is our tax rate. So the point is, many of these other states have personal property taxes, we don't. Now, back to our budget. The way to look at the all funds budget is, this is another thing that most people have no idea about. What do you mean our budget's 71 billion? I thought it was 35 billion. Well, the 35.4 billion is the general revenue fund budget in green. The uh, 8 billion in blue, that's the, the federal money we get, which we use to run a lot of state programs, like the EPA or the uh, Department, of, Department of Employment Security. Um, and then the red are fees and fines, and we use some of that to run some state departments. But those are all of these little checking accounts that we have, which is, you know, $27 billion. And this is where people can rightfully criticize us for not having a lot of transparency. And so uh, if you collapsed all of those funds into the general revenue fund, uh, it might be easier to follow our budgeting. Uh, but of course, the, recip the, the folks that pay the fees or that pay the fines, they want that money to go into those, those places where they know that the money will be there. Although, there's been times when we have taken money from those other state funds. The recent Supreme Court case said we can do that, because after all, it's money we've collected for state government. Um, and so we sometimes try to pay part of our budget by these other state funds. And that's, that's where the, uh, the conflict is, because sometimes folks say, you know, insurance companies, you know, we want to make sure the money's going to the Department of Insurance. Um, and so that's where you get the fight. Now, but let's focus on the general revenue fund budget. The red is the discretionary spending. These are the areas that are driven by a law. They're determined by a law or a formula. So we call them uh, uh, discretionary. Actually, that's switched. It should be non-discretionary, right? So the, 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 I think, the, unless I got my, my pie chart switched, the, that should be non-discretionary in the right. But they're almost equal, so we can, we can make the point when we go through the next slide. The next slide is the, um, the actual pies of this year's budget. So let's start at the lower left-hand corner. This is Medicaid. This would be uh, the Medicaid program. We saved an enormous amount of money when we passed the SMART Act. Um, it's 23% of our total general revenue fund budget, and of course it's driven by a formula. If you want to get savings in Medicaid, you got to pass a law, which we did. We reduced some benefits, we changed some eligibility uh, rules, we you know, raised the hospital assessments, we, we made some changes, and that is what we appropriated this year. We'll look at pensions. That's that 17% of the budget, an extra 900 million this year, and the debt service is 5%, so it's a total of 22%. The others are debt service on capital bonds and statutory transfers out. Statutory transfers out, half of that is the local government distributive fund. So a per capita distribution to counties and cities of a percentage of our income tax goes out in the statutory transfers out. Now the mayors uh, who might be here or the mayors, or former mayors or county officials Many of you think that that money is actually in, guaranteed you from maybe the Constitution, and that's not the case. It's actually a law that we could change. And it's been proposed that we give you less of that money and say, hey, we're broke here. We want to pay our old bills. We're not going to give you so much money. That's what Governor Christie did, by the way, when he got elected in New Jersey. He took all the money from locals and said he cut spending. So, but of course, if you cut money that goes to local governments, there's things like police and fire and other services that those cities perform that would be adversely affected. But that's what that money is. It's, uh, what is that, two, about two billion? Yeah, two bi little over two billion dollars, okay? We give it out to uh, local governments and I think the RTA and downstate mass transit are the other items. So those are the, um, the parts that go out the door, okay? The, that's the part that we, we have to pass a law if we were going to uh, want to spend less. 
And so the rest on the right side is what we have left over. So government services and public safety and regulation, that's basically you know, the prisons and the state government. It's always interesting to point out that that's a real small percentage of our total budget, right? We're kind of a big pass-through agency. In fact, when you count all of the other state employees that you know, work to provide the services for Medicaid, uh, and you only have a total of about 11% of our total budget that goes out for the actual operation of state government. And we have the lowest ratio of state employees to population in the nation. We have the lowest ratio of state employees to population in the nation. So um, when folks say, you know, cut the waste, okay, where would you like to start? Um, Okay, human services, you know who, who these are. These are folks that are not-for-profits and provide vital services for seniors, for disabled kids who are usually non-union, uh, primarily all non-union, don't have a lot of money from year to year, and we give them contracts and they provide those services. And they've been getting, uh, as, as Ralph has documented, they've been getting dramatically uh, reduced as a percentage of the total budget over the years. And then we have our school, P P12, 19% of the total. Actually, when you add the, you know, that's why when you compare schools to pensions, you can almost say pensions are, are higher. And then higher ed, 5% uh, of the total. So we've been, you know, the, the stuff on the right has been getting squeezed as we've had to reduce, uh, uh, I'm sorry, increase our, our payments to the pension system. So what do we feel like we accomplished this year in our budget? Well, first of all, it's balanced. Now, this is uh, a word that, you know, people can have different meanings for what's balanced. What I would say is this. How can you say it's balanced if you still owe a bunch of money? And we still do. Um, here's what I would say. In the next 12 months, we are anticipating a certain amount of money we, we have authorized the ability to spend a certain amount of money, and we're going to have a certain amount of obligations. We have covered all those obligations. We're not going to spend more than we've authorized in the next 12 months. And, and hopefully, at the same time, we can pay down some of those old bills. And we did that by relying upon eliminating those liabilities in fiscal year 13 through that supplemental uh, because of that, that surprise. We do get uh, education back up even more than the, than the previous year, which I think was the first time in five years. Uh, we've increased human services uh, by, again, paying those, those liabilities, providing enough money for those liabilities. Um, and that, I think, is going to give them some predictability. Uh, they just want to know when they're going to get paid. So with that, I would be happy to uh, stop and be open for any questions if uh, we have enough time. And once again, thank you for inviting me today. Ralph. You explained it as part of the fiscal cliff from the federal government, and you said we got an additional 1.2 billion, but I was under the impression that the federal fiscal cliff or se sequestration uh, caused uh, less money coming yeah, to the le states. Leading up to last year, uh, the, the federal, the, the uncertainty among folks that had some assets was whether or not the income tax was going to go up. The corp, you know, the, they thought the tax rates were going to go up after the fiscal cliff, so they sold a bunch of assets, creating a taxable event. That was in last year, last, let's say last November. Okay? You can tell from the look on your face I'm not doing so well. And, 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 then, when, and then when they filed their income tax this year, in April, they paid the, they had to pay higher taxes because they, they had sold assets the previous year. And that was a surprise for, that's one of the reasons why the federal deficit went down, big increase in revenues. All the states had an increase in, in revenues, uh, and not just Illinois. So that's what, that, what happened. Um, at least that's what we think happened. In either case, we got 1.2 billion, so, and we spent it. <laughs> we authorized it. Yes. Senator Oberweiss, how are you? It's fine. Uh, Senator, if I could just add a comment to go a little bit further with that. Uh, obviously, we had a situation where 
business people and investors looked at the fact that federal rates were going to be increased this year, so there was a tendency to want to realize more capital gains last year than they otherwise would have. And on top of that, small businesses probably had a tendency to uh, postpone some deductions that they might have taken last year to be able to deduct them this year or realize less income last year than they might otherwise. So uh, pretty much across the country, as you were just right. saying, uh, there was an increase in reported income, which meant an increase in taxes received by the state of Illinois in April. And I, I believe that our, our budget people expected that, anticipated that, and understood that. But what might have been forgotten is that for those who, who have earnings primarily through S corporations or LLCs, uh, their uh, tax payments are generally not through withholding, but rather through estimated payments. Mm -hmm. And as a result of having to pay higher taxes for 2012 income in April of, of uh, 13, they were also, to get into the safe harbor, uh, they have to pay 100% of the, 23, uh, the 2012 liability in the 2013 estimated payments. So not only would we get an extra bump in April of 2013, we should get a further bump in June and September and December, January. However, and I hope people keep this in mind, uh, particularly our comptroller and anybody who's, who's thinking about spending the extra money, that all reverses come April of next year because right. people then will have already paid estimated taxes, will not have to make regular payments, and their estimated payments will be decreasing. So I, I, I hope people don't get too excited about this surprise windfall because it's temporary and it's going away. Right. I wanted to indicate Senator Oberweiss is a state senator, freshman this year, um, and uh, has been a great member of the Senate, uh, and he was, is much more qualified in explaining uh, the mentality of people with assets last year, and <laughs> and what and what their what their thinking might have been had they wanted to minimize their tax liabilities, um, and so he did a much better job than I did in explaining that. Wherever you want to go, the lady with the mic is the in charge. You have to raise your hand to her, not me. I don't have a mic. Thank you for your comments. Um, in the, the governor's budget, he mentioned that you guys were honestly in, um, balancing the budget, um, and you also mentioned that we, you're going to use the 1995 um, payment schedule, uh, which I believe the SEC um, said was a fraudulent schedule because it seriously underfunds the pensions. Um, so are you not really balancing the budget using a dishonest um, wow. ba pension schedule? Well. They might be talking about the 1995 law, which uh, says that we have to be 90% funded by 2045. What some critics of that law said was that it, it was a ramp to get us to 90% funded by 2045, starting in, 20, in, in 1995. The uh, argument against it was that the first 10 years, the ramp was uh, too low so that we actually underfunded the pension fund by law. And it was only 10 years later, uh, in 2005 or so, when that ramp started to go up. And that's what we're under right now. So I think what the governor was saying is, you made your statutory payment. You didn't have to go out and borrow it. You made your statutory payment, which was about a billion dollars more than the previous year, and next year's gonna be another billion. So. So I think that's what they're referring to. The, the, the fact is that we are on a path, if we follow this law and don't change it, to, to pay money into the pension fund. The problem is that it's just an enormous amount of money and it crowds out the rest, the rest of the budget. So it's, it's honest to pay what the law requires. It now is past that underfunded ramp, so now we're paying you know, what the actuaries would probably say we should pay. Now, there's other ways of restructuring that payment which is something which this organization has proposed, and we're also talking about lowering our liabilities, obviously, uh, to the pension system, which would change how much you have to pay in, cut down on the, uh, on the crowding out. I'm, I'm looking for our lady with the mic. Yeah. So, uh, well, he, he actually knows what he's talking about, uh, but more than I do. I told you, it's an intimidating crowd. The, the SEC did not evaluate the state's pension payment schedule. The SEC has no role whatsoever in terms of the state's pension systems. What the SEC did was issue a ruling that certain 
disclosures in certain bond issues uh. that the state issued did not fairly represent potential risk from that. But they, they yep. gave no opinion at all on the Great. propriety of the, of the pension repayment schedule. Great. Thank you. And that's true. Senator, you've made a very thorough case that Illinois government is as lean as it can possibly be and that we have a lower tax liability than any of our neighbors. So why is it that the state legislature has not considered and then passed either a transactions tax or uh, a tax on services? Well, I would think that there's going to be a time uh, since there's a governor's election, uh, it's almost impossible to pass any major tax without the governor's support. Uh, transaction taxes are controversial, but there's other sources of revenue that people consider. There's a whole bunch of loopholes. In fact, the state senate has passed a f uh, has closed a, f a few to raise money. That should be in the mix. I got in big trouble once, even mentioning that we don't tax retirement income. So I'm not going to say that this time. <laughs> but it seems to me that the timing on all this is hopefully there'll be a dialogue next year during the governor's race, whoever are the nominees, and leading up to the primary, where they're going to explain how, <laughs> if you go back to that chart, how are they going to make up for the $5 billion in reduction once the income tax goes down? I mean. I'm just asking, right? That should be the, the, the discussion, including the Democrat, right? And, and um, Governor Edgar proved that you don't have to lie, you know? I mean, you, you can say, we think we should keep it at a certain rate, and it might be higher than what it otherwise would be, and you can still win. So that would be the time to do a grand bargain, if you will. Uh, many people have said that this, the sales tax, the interesting thing about folks talking about um, other states having lower taxes, uh, I'm going to retire to Florida instead of Illinois. Florida doesn't have an income tax, but for retirees, neither do we. But they have sales taxes on everything that we don't. So it's actually cheaper to retire in Illinois. It might not be as warm, but it's actually cheaper to <laughs> retire in Illinois. So th but those are the things that people don't even, they're not even aware of them. So um, many folks have talked about the sales tax, Expanding the base, increasing it to services. You know, you buy oil for your oil change, you don't pay sales tax on the service. Expanding it like other states. We actually did that in the Illinois State Senate. We passed an income tax, I think it was three years ago, 2009, that expanded the sales tax on services. And it, we, all we did was to cover every state that touches Illinois, and we just said we want to tax uh, services that they tax. And I think it raised something like $700 million. So it can be done it's, if, as long as it's part of a big, big package. Okay. Final question for the Senate. I noticed on your chart that Illinois is the only state uh, of the Midwest states that has the, the flat income tax. Everybody else's is graduated to some degree. Do you think there's any appetite for looking at that? Because that's one of the issues that creates our structural deficit is, you know, the yeah. inability to. Well, first of all, it's, it's uh, number one, it's difficult to do that because you need a constitutional amendment, number one. Number two, uh, back in 2009, in addition to having the sales tax be expanded to cover some services, we also uh, made it more progressive. I think we had a family uh, tax credit, and we increased the earned, in, earned income tax credit. In fact, I remember working with, with Ralph on that, and I, I think we made it really pretty progressive, much more so than, you'd be surprised how much you can get out of that by increasing the, the, uh, the, the uh, deductible, um, the exemption, sorry, the exemption, and, and add a family tax credit, increase the education tax credit, uh, and the earned income tax credit. So I think that we could uh, avoid having to go through the whole rigmarole of a constitutional amendment. I don't think we have the votes for it as well. So, Once again, thank you very much for inviting me.
you know, as someone who, who works in a bipartisan organization that deals with elected officials all the time, I have to say we are very appreciative of the Senate President's work over the years on tax policy. He's been one of the very few elected officials that has taken quite publicly the stand that the state does in fact need more revenue and as Senate President Cullerton himself pointed out, even passed a few bills through the Senate to accomplish that very thing only to see them flounder in the other side of the General Assembly. So uh, I have to say that uh, working with Senate President Cullerton is always fun because in addition to the fact that he has a wonderful sense of humor, he's a policy wonk at his heart and he, he was way too humble talking about his grasp of the budget. He certainly knows it inside and out. Now I, we're going to bring one of our directors who you just heard speak, Steve Schnorf, come up here to introduce State Comptroller Judy Bartopinka. Uh, but before that, I do want to make two more quick announcements. First is Senator Pam Altoff, who's originally scheduled to be on our panel today, called in very sick this morning. She even stayed downtown overnight last night instead of her home in McHenry County, hopeful that she'd wake up this morning feeling better, and she very much did not. So she offers her sincere apologies to everyone here for not coming. I also, you know, whenever you put together an event or you run an organization, work in an organization that does a lot of policy work, you have to acknowledge the fact that the staff steps to the plate and does all the hard work. And I don't think the staff at CTBA sort of gets the credit that they really deserve uh, for the, the incredible amount of hours they put in for what I can promise you is very low pay. So I'm going to individually acknowledge the different staff members at CTBA and, and really thank them for their hard work, not just in putting together this event, but those reports that you are reading there, that website tool I told you about for the budget, this was done by CTBA staff. So Amanda Cass, our research and policy specialist who does a lot of pension work. Jennifer Lozano, who's a research associate and who does a lot of work on the income tax. Bobby Otter is our education specialist. And those are the three that really do the substantive work. Now, as far as this event is concerned, we have two staff members that, but for their contributions, there would be no event ever at CTBA, much less this one, uh, Tracy Schomburger and, and Kathy Miller, who both went above and beyond the call of duty in putting this together. <laughs> Kathy also runs development for the organization and yells at me constantly that I'm very bad at the job and don't do what I should be doing. So she, she did remind me to, to acknowledge the fact that there are, in fact, contribution envelopes on the table if you are so inclined. We are a 501c3, fully tax deductible. Like us on Facebook, please, if you could. And if you are tweeting this event, like Linda Lenz from the Catalyst Magazine is doing today, uh, please mention our event with hashtag CTBA. And on those final housekeeping, uh, uh, well, you know, I'm going to say one thing about the, the comptroller, state comptroller. So I, I first met Judy Barr Topinka during Rod Blagojevich's inauguration for his initial swearing in as governor of the state of Illinois. Do you remember this? Okay. Now, uh, <laughs> our organization truly is bipartisan, and our board of directors. Uh, bears it out, Stephen Schnorf, who's going to be introducing Judy Barr, direct, uh, t Judy Barr to Pinka today, was the director of the Bureau of the Budget under Governors Edgar and Ryan. So the only Republican game in town during that inaugural ceremony was Judy Barr to Pinka's. She was the only Republican constitutional officer. She was treasurer at the time. I had never met her. So I went through, you know, those long receiving lines you have to go through when you meet a constitutional officer. I go through that line and I'm standing there for what seemed like eons and I finally get to the treasurer. I say, hi, Madam Treasurer, my name is, she grabs my hand, says, I know who you are. You're Ralph Martiri, you're, you're from that Center for Tax and Budget Group, right? I said, yes, Madam Treasurer, I am. She goes, I've read some of your columns. Do you really mean what you say or are you full of it? <laughs> I, I, I mean what I say, Madam Treasurer, I, I do. She goes, well, you claim to be bipartisan. Will you work with me? I'm a good Republican. She suggests me and I will. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you what I want to work on, and I'm going to inform you on the three different things and who's responsible for it, and we're going to get right to it. I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Walked off thinking that was odd. 
And, and that was on a Sunday evening, the inaugural parties are. Monday is the inauguration. Tuesday, I get back into my office. I have an email from 7 a.m. directly from Judy Bard to Pinka, the treasurer of the state of Illinois. Ralph, here are the five things I want to work on with your organization. Here are the people in my office who are responsible for them. If they don't contact you by tomorrow, you call me and we'll get it done. Judy. How many constitutional officers are that approachable, that willing to work with people on substance right from the get-go? So I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Madam Topinka, and I just had to say that before she's officially introduced by Stephen Schnorr, our director. Stephen? I am Steve Snorf, and I am glad to be here today, and I am so glad you are all here today. Uh, I have the uh, uh, very uh, pleasant task of introducing someone now. I don't think anyone here today will top Kathy and Senator Cullerton. Judy and I did not go to high school together. Uh, I think she was pre-kindergarten when I was in high school. But I have known her a long time. I met her when she was a reporter for uh, the Suburban Life newspapers, about 1974, I would say, uh, and have been, you know, have had the honor of having a relationship with her since that time. Uh, most of you, I suspect in here at one time or another, have met Judy. If you haven't met her, you've seen her on television. You know she is not, uh, the cut and dried, uh, aloof, uh, pontificating, vague public official that we sometimes get in situations like this. Um, as I said, it's an honor for me to introduce Judy. Uh, she uh, has a record, I think, that speaks for itself. She's a graduate of Northwestern University. She was elected state representative in 1980. She was elected state senator in 1984. She was elected state treasurer in 1994, 1998, 2002, and was elected state comptroller in 2010. Uh, she's the first woman elected Illinois state treasurer the first woman re-elected to a statewide constitutional office, the first woman to be elected to two different state constitutional offices. She's living proof that you don't have to be a radical right winger to win elections in the state of Illinois as a Republican. She has led the Republican ticket and total votes received each time she's been on the ballot statewide. And I don't think you will hear her spouting some of the vileness and negativism uh, that you frequently hear from one wing of my Republican Party. It is my honor to introduce to you and to welcome here today State Comptroller Judy Barr Topenka. That was uh, quite an introduction. We only forgot one in there. You know, I've held uh, two constitutional offices. I did try for three, if any of you recall, and we would have saved a lot of money had I won. Let me tell you, that would have been a very great help to our budget right then and there. But it really, I, I, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you for uh, just a nice, warm welcome. And, uh, you know, uh, to follow John Cullert. And I have to tell you, I, I really like John very much. In spite of his being a Democrat, it's OK. It's OK. He's just misguided. But, you know, one way or another, he, and I'm only teasing, because John and I go back in the legislature. I come from the legislature. Uh, we've gone through the House and the Senate together and so on and uh, have a very good working relationship all the way around. 
uh, it, it pleases me that we have found much in common and that we were able to, uh, to work on bills together. Uh, some we have fought out. Uh, he, he has a tendency to take out these goody-goody bills, and I just hate them. You know, motorcycle helmets and uh, smoking tax, if we try to tax them out of existence, and um, you know, seat belts, all that kind of stuff. I, I don't care for that kind of stuff. I think that just violates uh, more independent and more of a libertarian on that front. I think people, when they're old enough, ought to take care of themselves and government ought to just butt out. But at the same time, I can truly say that our high water mark, in my opinion, uh, was when we were able to literally sneak a little something in because I don't think we could have passed it on its own. It was so unpopular. And you may still find it unpopular, but uh, John and I were able to pass legislation which said that everyone had to do jury service. They had to show up. When we got there, there were 26 groups that were exempt. And all that left for this, quote, jury of your peers uh, was the old, the sick, and those without any clout. And so as a result, uh, you know, I kept getting these elderly people in my office, uh, many of them, you know, who had problems like bladder control and now had been asked 15 times to go for jury duty because they couldn't find anybody else. So now everybody has to go. And um, again, it's not real popular with a lot of people, but you know what? It's the basis of a democracy. It's the only thing our Constitution really asks of us. And I figure if it's good enough for me to go, it's good enough for you to go too. So that's where we're at. Um, it, so it goes. You know? But I was happy to see the finish line here at the end of another grueling legislative session, though it ended rather early at 8 p.m. Everybody threw up their hands and went home. And uh, I certainly can't imagine the relief that uh, Senator Cullerton felt. Uh, this, with this august group, because you're a very smart group, John kind of intimated, you know, we'll talk to, to nice groups, but they're not quite as adept on all these issues as you are. So you are somewhat intimidating. Though I must admit that uh, two weeks ago, I was able to give a version of this speech at Baylor University where my son, who is in the United States Army and about to retire after 20 years, uh, rooked me into a speech uh, in the course that he is teaching for the Army on healthcare law and ethics. And we take that pretty seriously in our family. So I was feeling pretty good on that, and it was the same type of group. They were very, very bright people, very engaged people, and that's what I consider all of you to be as well. So it is somewhat intimidating. Steve Snorf and I do go back together. We did not go to school together because I went to a girls' school, and that uh, ended that right away, although you will still find a gentleman around the state of Illinois who will swear that they went to school with me at three different high schools, none of which I attended. And that doesn't count uh, the ones who say they're either related to me, and I'm an only child, so that's pretty limiting right there. And then the other ones who said they dated me, and always being kind of a dork, I really didn't date that much. So as a result, very limiting. But I have found my little spot here and, and uh, really enjoy, enjoy the, uh, the work we do in fiscal matters, even though sometimes you get up in the morning and you think, my God, how are we gonna get through another day of this? Because it is so difficult being the chief fiscal officer of what is basically a, um, uh, a bankrupt state. And, and uh, you know, if we could declare bankruptcy, we would. Uh, or, you know, it's, it's just that bad. Of course, Fitch has just, uh, lowered our credit rating again. That'll be the 13th lowering of a credit rating in four years. Uh, that's, that's just awful. I mean, it's just embarrassing. Having worked with Ralph Martiri, I have to tell you, he is a jewel. I love it every time he comes into my office. And he does describe the situation of how we first met and started working on fiscal issues together. I, I really enjoy working with him. I like the fact that your group comes together and really pays attention to what is the bedrock here of, of Illinois and how we are suffering because of things that have gone on over probably a period of 30, 40 years. This did not happen overnight. But he really pays attention, he knows what he's talking about, and it is a delight to have him in the office. Now, before we get into all the fun of all this just completed legislative session, 
um, and, and the fiscal mess that our state finds itself in, I, uh, I do want to let you know that I, I appreciate the information you provide, the, the delivery analysis, so your staff work does not go to waste. We, we just eat it up. And the awareness that you provide for the public, because this is not a glamorous issue. It doesn't make for easy headlines. It doesn't make for, for easy explanations. And so the public at large really needs a little bit of help in moving along here to, to understand what's going on in a budgetary system which, as Senator Cullerton alluded to, uh, is not necessarily the most transparent uh, of budgetary uh, processes and does have these little side accounts that doesn't all come together in a very unified budget. So when, when I hear that a budget is balanced in the state of Illinois, I, I kind of snicker because it's really never balanced. And there's always these little side accounts. Congress does it too. It's just ways of getting around the real budgeting. And, and that's what we wind up with. And that also helped us get into trouble. So even more than that, you know, the CTBA, I think, takes the next step of talking about how we can make things better and of actually offering solutions. And I really do appreciate that because we, we are bombarded daily with telephone calls with, with uh, individuals, corporations, non-for-profits in the state of Illinois because of late payments and things of this sort. So it is, it is difficult and yet you offer solutions rather than just complaining and I, I just appreciate that very much. You know, at this point, we've got enough people pointing out our state's problems, so we need more groups like yours that really get into it and help us try and work things out. Now, obviously, the topic of the day is the recent legislative session and how it fares for Illinois. Needless to say, we were watching it very, very carefully. I'm sure you've heard and read the analysis in recent days from pundits, uh, columnists, editorial boards and others that are downright uh, apocalyptic here about what did and didn't happen. I don't know if it's true, but I heard that the Chicago Tribune editorial board is now building an ark. <laughs> huh? And if the rain falls, we'll be able to launch it. You know, I mean, uh, unreal. In the fairness, there are certainly concerns that we'll get to, but there are also some accomplishments I think worth highlighting. The General Assembly passed what is being called the Economic Development Act of 2013, which includes giving the go-ahead to a new arena and a hotel at McCormick Place as part of a larger effort to attract more visitors, conventions, and dollars to the lakefront. So I congratulate Senator Toy Hutchison, I see her out there, who is a special favorite of mine, who is on your panel today for getting that done. Now, I do believe that there's a straw horse hiding in there somewhere for a casino, you know, and I just throw that out there. You don't have to answer it, Toy, but um, I, I've always supported a, a casino for Chicago, not necessarily the way it was coming through the, the factory here in the legislature, but, um, you know, that, that may very well be what's going on, and I'm not the only one saying it. Democrats and Republicans also agreed on a concealed carry legislation before a court mandated a deadline for addressing the issue and approved a bill that balances safety concerns with our Second Amendment right to bear arms. Okay, uh, couldn't come together on a pension, but we got together on concealed carry. I think that's kind of a, an interesting little sidelight to all this. Lawmakers approved a uh, medical marijuana law to show compassion for our sick, gave the go-ahead to fracking in the hopes of fueling new jobs and economic development in Southern Illinois. So we do have now medical marijuana, which will make us feel better if we don't have the money to pay our bills. And um, we can just go and be fracked out in uh, Southern Illinois. Uh, I hope the water is good when we get through with all that. Now, members get a gold star from me for rejecting a request, and I really couldn't believe this. I found it stunning. A request from the Chicago Public Schools to take a pension holiday. A pension holiday, we're already in the hole, and we come up with a bill at the end of the session for another pension holiday. We somehow don't 
watch the history of the state of Illinois, and we should know by now that pension holidays are a re recipe for disaster. It's one of the things that got us in this mess. So there are some things to feel good about. But of course, we've got some, out some outstanding issues. After it looked like the marriage equality vote was imminent, the House delayed action to allow members more time. Sadly, it comes down to politics. Candidates want to see if they have a primary before taking such a controversial vote. You know you get elected to make decisions, and a decision should have been made that night. And frankly, it, it could have been a historical decision, and um, sadly, it was not. And uh, you know, we are one nation of laws. That apparently is not working very well in Illinois. So I'm hoping we'll revisit that issue and do the right thing. And I think we had another stutter step on, you know, you know. Well, you know, it's just not fair. It's just not fair if you just want to talk basic fairness, which I've always held as a guide, just not fair. So anyway, we had another stutter stop on gaming expansion. Yeah, we're gonna make all this money and that's gonna settle all our problems. And the early session momentum started waning in the final days. And once again, the issue is going to have to wait for another day. Because you know, gaming board chairman Jaffe has suggested that a Chicago casino be subject to the same oversight as existent in, in other casinos. Now there's a novel twist, huh? I think he's right. You know, it should not get special consideration. A casino is a casino is a casino and ought to be run like that. And no special deals there. But that's my humble opinion. And then there's the elephant in the room, pension reform. Now, of course, it's incredibly frustrating that another session has come and gone without resolution. But it's important that this be done right and, and not just passed so it could be done, uh, declared as done. This is a touchy issue. A lot of people's lives depend upon it. And I'm not gonna scapegoat a bunch of, of state employees or teachers or folks who really and truly give of their time and talents for not the greatest amount of money and then hope that they're going to have some kind of a financial underpinning that many have already planned on because of the situation as it was. I'm not about to throw them under the bus because it's much easier to take a meat ax out there and try and rip this thing up. It needs to be handled you know, slowly and gently and with forethought because it does affect the lives of just about everybody in the state of Illinois. And, and so it, it worries me that if there's a rush to judgment here that we do get it right. Some, you know, well, that's not to make you feel good. That's literally how I feel. And uh, I, I think that's probably one of the reasons that I felt that the Cullerton proposal was a fairer proposal than the Madigan proposal. And if somehow the, the pieces of those could come together uh, where we could take the good from both of these and, and compromise and maybe get something going, uh, well, I'm gonna have to leave that to the legislature, but that's gonna have to be the way to go. It will be, and I think it will provide some fairness. But what impressed me about the Cullerton proposal was the push toward constitutionality. You know, there's no sense putting a bill out there that's gonna go to court and get thrown out and we're gonna start at square one again and at $17 million a day uh, going into our unfunded liability, it, it's just gonna give me gray hair under all that hair dye. So please, you know, <laughs> it, it, you just need some time here. Uh, sometimes I think people forget that we have this pesky clause in our state constitution that protects pension benefits from being diminished. So if benefits are changed, and obviously there needs to be something done, there needs to be a trade-off or a consideration for public employees. And I think that might work. If we overlook the fact of that constitutionality, then why have a constitution? That's for starters. Again, the court situation. And finally, you know, what just drives me crazy, I have people from, from in Illinois who find all these things in other states on Google and whatever, and they send them and say, see, wh see what Rhode Island has done. Oh, this is just terrific. Well, it's not in Rhode Island's constitution. We have a very unique situation here. You know, if, if, 
I didn't say anything that worthwhile, really. I mean, it's, it's just not that good yet. Wait and just wait. I'm building up to it, okay? <laughs> then you'll get the Ralph Martiri number. You know, I mean, it'll be all good. But uh, it, it, there are so many other states who've been able to deal with the pension situation because it is not in their state constitution. It's state law. You can make state law, you can break state law. It's a little harder to get constitutional amendments to come and go. And you can imagine that at the Constitutional Convention of 1970, which enacted this phrase, this discussion came up and there was a desire of protection for employees for the, of the state of Illinois. And that's why it got there in the first place. So it's going to have to be dealt with, but again, I think it has to be dealt with honorably and gently and not with a meat ax. I really hate meat ax approaches to things because they're things that are not negotiated out where all parties participate and we come up with the common good. Sometimes I think we forget about the common good and that, that is not in my game plan here. So when I, when I back President Cullerton's plan by pulling all the parties together and working collaboratively, I think he produced a pretty good compromise. Now, it doesn't make as much money sa in savings as the Madigan plan does. And I think the Madigan plan, you know, there are a lot of work went into that. No one should take it lightly because, because, because people did try very hard to, to salvage the most amount of money out of pension plans and writing a, 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 what could be uh, just a, a wholesale uh, a pension problem for us. But I think this kind of started us on the road to compromise. And while the bill is not perfect, and none of these are, it saved a significant amount of money and it addressed the little detail of being constitutional. That at the end of the line, we'd have something. We would not be forced to go to square one. Now, unfortunately, that bill never went to the House floor. I do believe if it had gone to the House floor, it would have passed overwhelmingly that there would have been a pension reform bill in our hands as the legislature walked out the door. It did pass the Senate, stalled in the House. And I think it was, and it continues to give us the best chance of getting our pension systems back on track. Yes, John Cullerton is a policy wonk, but he's taken the time to move this along in an orderly fashion to get something done. Now we need to get it done, there's no question about it. Remember, 17 million a day as we sit here today, we're racking up another 17 million. Yesterday, Fitch downgraded us to an A minus. You can figure that before long that the other two rating agencies will come along for the ride as well. So when you put it all together, I would give the General Assembly an incomplete. Not an A or an F, but an incomplete. And hopefully uh, the folks that uh, you know, were, were either unable to vote for something or just could not get it together to vote for something, uh, hopefully they will now calm down, get their brains in order, and start making it happen. I think it's worth noting that all that unfinished work becomes more difficult from here on out because May 31st was not only the end of the legislative session, but the symbolic start of the political season. Uh -oh. <laughs> we had one candidate already announced for a governor within 48 hours of the end of session. And, we're and others are expected to follow in the weeks ahead. So the elbows are already starting to fly because this one's gonna get pretty ugly. It's very sad, I'd like to think it'd be a little more civil, but having been in some ugly ones myself, I can tell you they're not nice and this one's not gonna be nice. So moving forward, when we talk about pensions and gaming, mar marriage and the like, it's going to be viewed against a backdrop of political jockeying, which further complicates matters. You'd like to think that people would vote for the highest, uh, highest desires that they have for the good of the order. Not necessarily. We all like our political careers. But even more than any of those specific issues as controller, I worry about Illinois' larger approach to budgeting and spending. As many of you know, the state had $1.3 billion more in tax revenue than expected this spring as residents and businesses made moves to take advantage 
of the 2012 federal tax rates. And I can't tell you the number of people in Springfield that asked how we could spend that money or where the General Assembly should appropriate new dollars. And it was eye-opening to say the least. I took every opportunity to deliver a reality check. We use every available dollar to pay down the state's bill backlog. And in fact, that tax season allowed us to take the bill backlog from $8.5 billion on April 1st to about $5.8 billion today. Now, how can we all get excited about $5.8 billion today? Yay, Ra! Only in Illinois can a backlog of $5.8 billion be a wonderful, exciting thing because we're always so darn much in the hole. Something like this is almost exciting, you know. But as I've told all others, there are, this is an improvement. Okay, it's nice. But there's no extra dollars out there lying around. I don't have a big pile of money sitting in the controller's office just waiting to be spent by the legislature or anybody else. Illinois is the only state in the nation with $5.8 billion in unpaid bills right now. And it didn't stop the General Assembly from hiking up the state budget by about $2 billion to a total of $35.4 billion this spring. They, they were spending it. They were spending it, and I don't have it in the office because we're paying it out. So if it's got to be spent, the majority went for education, which is a good thing, but I can't back it up with money. That's the only problem. It sounds nice, but I can't back it up with money. Now, a lot of that increase is for not only education, but human services. And I appreciate that because golly knows, between the Medicaid cuts and the way we've cut education over the years, which is a, a horrible thing because this is our next generation, and those kids only have one shot at it. You know, they're not waiting around for us to make decisions. They're growing up and going through the system. The money is just not there to back up the commitment, and we're going to just be digging in a little deeper. Even more galling, the, uh, the General Assembly included $500 million for earmarks. Well, you know, how's that? Earmarks, that's a fancy word, you know, for just pork. Pork. We had enough money for pork. Come on. You know, there's kids out there. There's sick people out there. There's old people out there. We've cut them till they can't see straight, but we got money for pork. Come on. If we can't afford the services we're providing, how do we justify funding special projects? It just doesn't make any sense. And I, you know, as I've gone around the state, I said, look, just because you got money, don't you go going all hog wild on me. You know, keep the budget flat. Don't add anything. Don't, inc don't start any new programs because you haven't paid for the old ones yet. Worry about paying your bills because that is what our rating, our credit rating is based on. That's what our state needs to do so we can once again hold our head high and not be embarrassed in, in, in the greater world. Uh, it was funny going down to Texas where my son is stationed and, and speaking at Baylor um, and, and having people ask about Illinois. They're quite stunned about how we operate. And I said, well, that must be true because you sent your goofy governor up here to try and uh, you know, steal our jobs. Why don't you just tell them to stay home because you're not doing so well either. Look at your education system and then I proceeded to go down a whole line and <laughs> they quieted it down, they quieted it down. And he's still goofy, all right? Yeah. Now, as a state, we need to operate with a unified understanding that even if revenue increases, and it will from time to time, we cannot afford to bump up spending. So you're still going to have to make cuts. There's just no question, and you're going to have to keep things flat. You cert I mean, you have homes, you have businesses. Do you spend what you don't have? What's not to understand here? I mean, it, it, don't dig us a deeper hole. What's right? the first rule of getting out of a hole? Stop digging. We're digging. The, the shovels are out. So as a state, we need to operate with a unified understanding that we cannot afford to bump up spending at this time. Maybe down the road a piece, but not yet. Along the same lines, we need to, to change our budgeting process to reflect reality, 
and not our hopes and our dreams. You know, everybody's watched enough reality shows, it's time for the real McCoy, and we need to face up to it right now. We've seen it happen time and time again with childcare providers, programs for the developmentally disabled, and other human services. The governor signs a budget that is declared balanced. And you know what happens in reality? Programs and agencies are underfunded with the promise of being dealt with later. That later comes when appropriations run out early in the spring. A crisis is created, public pressure mounts, and ultimately a supplemental spending bill is passed. Supplemental means outside the budget. This was not accounted for. Suddenly we're adding something, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul, we're plugging holes, we're doing bad things again with money. This year's supplemental bills totaled more than $1.8 billion. And that's money on top of the budget. You know, it's fun when you're budgeting like this and can play with it like this. Yeah, uh, we need more transparency, that's for sure. Now, in no way to do business, it's not the way to do business, and it's certainly uh, a, a game playing here that we've helped dig us into, into this hole because it gave us money to do lots of little projects that we like, and it makes people look good politically, and then we kick the can down the road, that old can, it's still going down there, and we still haven't stopped it. In fact, we're now three years into the biggest tax increase in state history, and one could argue that on the whole, our fiscal situation has not improved at all, and in some cases, it's worse. Now, the folks who've been budgeting using that tax increase, they've been using it as if it were real money. Well, it's not real money, it's funny money, it's borrowed money. It's money that's temporary, Remember the promise? It's temporary. It means it's going to go away. But it has been counted into the budget as if this is our money lock, stock, and barrel. When that, if, they're, if the legislature is going to live up to its, uh, its uh, feelings, that it should uh, live up to its uh, contract and promise that it should withdraw this money it stop the 2% tax that we got, it's going to leave a tremendous hole, hole the size of a Grand Canyon. Now, I really do think that we have to live up to our promises. I mean, we've already got promises that are being broken with employees and pension plans and so on. Now we're looking at this tax increase that, uh, that was out there temporarily. We might consider looking at what uh, President Preckwinkle and the Cook County Board did when she had a percentage of a sales tax to get rid of and promised she'd get rid of it. Why not whack at it a little bit at a time? But start the processes now so that suddenly when this thing is due, we're not gonna have that big old hole. So that's what it means. If Illinois cannot afford to lose sight of the urgency of getting our fiscal house in order, our budgets are gonna have to stay as lean as possible with any extra revenue going toward unpaid bills, first and foremost. And we have to knock off the budget number games that only hurt us in the long run. Because ultimately our state's woes begin and end with finances. We have the assets, the abilities, the labor force, just about everything that makes a great state. So why aren't we great? And it's all about finances. And I think you have to keep an open mind legislatively in our office as fiscal officer as to what our tax structure is like. And maybe we should start talking about it really seriously to do a little house cleaning. So Ralph, I think you're gonna have to come into the office again and we're gonna have another sit down and start looking at what the possibilities are. And I would hope that our congressional delegation would start that process as well because our income tax, our federal income tax situation the IRS, well, I know I told my crew they're having a uh, manager's meeting today, and I said, you're not going to get motivational speakers, <laughs> not after the IRS. <laughs> we time to clean that place up, time to clean up our mess as well. So I look forward to working with you to making that happen, keeping in mind that we're never going to solve all our problems in a single legislative session, no matter how successful it is. So, thank you again, and I'd now be happy to take any questions. Oh, I should probably give you one parting shot. We today have 
53,925 unpaid bills at the controller's office, totaling $3.4 billion, and they date back to May 3rd. So we're actually buzzing along pretty well. Now, when you include estimates of bills at agencies, the backlog reaches $5.8 billion. On April 1st, we had $8.5 billion in unpaid bills, dating back to December 3rd. By August, we expect the backlog to be back at about $7.5 billion. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Uh, yes, sir? I'll follow the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there have been a couple of ideas uh, from CTVA that uh, you had mentioned that were solution-oriented. From graduated income tax to tax on services to any other ideas that you've heard floated about, what are the ideas that are out there now that you think either have the most merit for exploration or have the most possibility of bridging the gap between Republicans and Democrats? Are there, are there solutions that, are, that actually have, have possibility of bridging the gap where something might actually get done? Well, first of all, I think we do have, as, as even Senator Cullerton, the President of the Senate said, I think you have to go after loopholes. You know, any giveaways. Cut any of the pork that's out there. This is not the time to, to send little uh, Hallmark cards to your friends and family and so on. But um, I think we need to look at the tax structure here, including the possibility of a graduated income tax. I've got an open mind to it, let's put it that way. I, I'm not completely sold on it because I think, I don't want to see a complicated system such as the federal government has, has created. I mean, you really get a monster thing. And the flat tax, you know, is really kind of neat. You could go to a, a uh, statewide sales tax of some sort, you know, on that. That's the possibility. I mean, golly, though, I sometimes feel in this state we've taxed everything but pet rocks, and that's probably on the verge of getting done. Um, the other thing on services, it has been tried and it has been consistently voted down. So I don't know if the timing is right there to look at that, but obviously if manufacturing, which was really and truly the, uh, the bulwark of Illinois taxation, has moved in other areas, it has left a big hole. And something has to fill it if people want the same goods and services that they've been able to get. So I think that discussion is ripe for, for, for discussion. I don't know where it's going to go because at this point I still feel in my heart of hearts the votes aren't there for it. But it's something to kick around and maybe start looking at. One more question, yeah, because I talk too much and that gets, that rules the whole thing and you won't get your lunch or whatever else has been promised. Ms. Ms. Comptroller, I, earlier um, the Senate President talked about how small the percentage of the state budget that actually goes to state operations is and certainly he mentioned how few uh, state employees we have per capita, but you know, you wouldn't know it from the political discourse of the last two, three years between the media and a lot of your you know, colleagues in Springfield, you think that state employees were like enemy number one and public employees were the cause oh, of all the problems. Yeah. And, and I know that you don't view it that way. You've just expressed your you know, views on sure. that. And certainly, you know, Governor Thompson recently gave a speech to a number of business leaders where he scolded them for this you know, maniacal focus on trying to you know, make a, a bully and bullying state employees. And I know, you know frankly, Governor Edgar didn't, he, you know, has expressed this same view as well. So, Given all that, I mean, on one hand, as a you know, representing state employees, we want to thank you for standing up and being honest and being, you know, sincere about the real problems we face and not, you know, buying into this. But as putting on your political hat, you mentioned we're going to have an ugly, you know, season coming up in the next year or so. Is there any way we can have an honest discussion about what the state's priorities are, what a rational revenue system is, how do we actually budget in a fair way? and have that in the context of the gubernatorial race and the other statewide races over the next two years. Because short of that, I don't see how we, we get out of this mess. And I know that you're, you've been a consistent voice on this. I'm wondering if you can share any insight on that. Well, first of all, there has to be bipartisanship, which is very difficult because of the gerrymandered districts that we have out there. I mean, you just cannot get people elected from some of these districts. People will not run. 
then because at least of the headlines of, of crud and corruption and so on, uh, good people don't want to run because you lose your privacy, you don't get paid a lot, you, got, you have bad hours, you probably wind up with you know, a, a bad stomach because either it's too big or it certainly hurts and there's plenty of heartburn. I mean, so what do you get for the deal? And, and it, it, there has to be bipartisanship there has to be some common ground here where we can't have both parties just so whacking at each other that they can't work together. When I came into the legislature, and I really would advocate that we go back to the old system of three representatives per district. At that point, we were able to get suburban, South Southern Illinois, Chicago, everybody came together and you had two representatives of the, same, of the majority party and one for the minority party. It worked very, very well. And unfortunately, our current governor came up with selling the, the folks the, the one person, one vote idea, which does make sense on face, but it doesn't allow for the conge 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 congeniality that we need to get things done and people need to get along. And we do have, in very often, uh, two different parts of the state. Northern and Southern Illinois are, are very, very different. And there has to be some feeling of coming together and finding common cause so that Chicago doesn't think of Southern Illinois as, as a bunch of rubes, and Southern Illinois doesn't think of all of Cook County, for all practical purposes, as Chicago and a place for crud and corruption. I mean, that's just not that. We have these stereotypes, so we have to get rid of those as we try to work things out. But uh, it's going to be difficult, because you, you've got to get over certain cultural gaps to make that happen. But I, th I think with the right leadership, it can be done. So I'm hopeful that any future governor here, and by the way, I'm not running for a governor, so you don't have to worry about that. You know, when they're done that, I'm gonna run for re-election as controller because I really would like to clean up the system and I wanna be a party to that. It's, it will be tough, but it can be done. It can be done, okay? You are the best. Love you. Oh, we got hugs and kisses? Hugs and kisses. Don't no, we mean quick? I like this. <laughs> this is the best deal I've had for months. You know, that's all good. Thank you. It's all good. All right, uh, Craig Delamore and our panel, please come up to the front. Hi, I'm back. Um, an additional pleasure today to introduce the moderator for our panel discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce Craig Delamore moderator for CTBA's 12th Annual Fiscal Symposium. Mr. Delamore is the political editor for WBBM News Radio 780 and 105.9 FM, a post he's held since 2001. Mr. Delamore joined WBBM in 1983 after several years with the Associated Press Radio Network in Washington, D.C. During his years with WBBM, he has performed a variety of jobs, including anchor, managing editor, legislative correspondent, suburban bureau chief. He has covered several national political conventions for WBBM. Mr. Delamore likes the challenge of helping to inform listeners about important issues facing them and getting behind the traditional headlines and sound bites to illustrate why some political events are memorable stories. CTBA has been honored to be on the other side of Mr. Delmore's microphone at important times. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Delmore. Well, thank you very much. And it looks like we're only about 10 minutes behind, so that's, for, for this group, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, so, because uh, we want to try and move things along. But uh, I do want to, uh, first off, thank, uh, thank Steve very much, and thank you all for the honor of, uh, of acting as moderator for this discussion again. Um, this, is, uh, th this is always a lot of fun. Uh, I'll tell you, we deal with a lot of cliches in my business, whether we like it or not. Um, this year in state government, we have been hearing them all season. 
The number one priority is jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, education is the number one priority. Uh, if we don't solve the pension crisis, we can't solve anything. Uh, we all want the same thing. We just differ in how to get there. And uh, here we are after the spring legislative session, and uh, education is still underfunded. The uh, pension crisis is still standing elephant-like in the corner, and people are still looking for jobs, jobs, jobs. So uh, we in the media are preparing to keep covering these stories as the circle goes round and round again. And uh, I've been covering the same story for something like 30 years now. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're about ready for a change. And, uh, you know, maybe some of those suggestions for changing it will come this afternoon. Uh, this is as good a time as any to take stock. And we have the panel that can help us uh, get off the wheel or slow it down or get it to take us someplace or whatever analogy you want to use. Um, our panel is made up of people who are on the front lines of the fiscal issues in one way or another, and that should make for a spirited discussion, which I am hoping uh, that we all together can, and they, of course, can, uh, can spark. Um, as, as was said earlier, uh, State Senator Pam Althoff uh, was, is not able to make it, and we wish her well. Um, and, uh, well, gosh, there wouldn't have been room for her at this table, so, <laughs> I don't know, but, <laughs> yeah. Yes, of course, and, and we do wish her well. Uh, I've, I've covered her a number of times, and it's, uh, it's a shame she's not going to be here. But um, I guess what I'm going to introduce the whole panel, and, uh, and then we'll go to the questions. So to, uh, let me make sure I have the questions right where they should be. Okay. So you always organize your papers before you come up. There we go. All right. And it's in the right order, too. Uh, it's Hamer, right? It is. I thought I remember that. Brian Hamer is director of the uh, Illinois Department of Revenue, a job he's had since 2003. Uh, he advises Governor Quinn on tax policy issues, and he's in charge of collecting $48 billion a year for state and local governments. He was a top revenue official with the city of Chicago prior to his state service. He's got his BA from Yale and his law degree from Columbia. That's the one in New York. Uh, <laughs> which actually I went to Columbia too, so I'm used to having to remind people of that. Um, State Senator Toy Hutchinson, uh, someone I have covered uh, often before, she's been in the Illinois Senate since 2009. This 40th District Democrat is the chair of the Senate Revenue Committee. Along with uh, their counterparts in the House, the committee members have been touring the state to hear ideas about the state's business tax structure. She also has a strong interest in transportation matters. Um, now, uh, replacing uh, Philip Nelson is uh, Chris Magnuson, who is the Executive Director of Operations and News and Communications for the Illinois Farm Bureau, and welcome. Uh, he joined the Farm Bureau in June of 2004. He's responsible for assisting the President with uh, issues in his area and directing news and communications something I would know about. In other words, if I needed to know something about the Farm Bureau, that's the guy I would call. Um, he also, uh, for, before joining the uh, Farm Bureau for seven years, was with uh, Smith Buckland as the Domestic Marketing Program Manager for the United Soybean Board. So, and, and welcome. And our final panelist uh, needs no introduction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Ralph Martiri is your host, and he's uh, the head of the uh, Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. He's part of the Federal Education Department's Education, Equity, and Excellence Commission, and this is why we don't introduce him that often, because that title is way too long. Uh, he lectures on public policy for Roosevelt University and has taught on several other at several other institutions. He's also an occasional guest on my uh, Sunday program at issue on uh, WBBM News Radio and is always welcome there. And sometimes we get him to fight with other people. Uh, so <laughs> and we both love jazz and have yet to arrange for our time to go listen to it. I know. It's been, what, 20 years? Uh, anyway, <laughs> what we're going to start off with is a single question for each of our guests, and these are questions that are from the uh, CBTA, so if any of them sound like they have a bias to it, it's not mine. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and actually, there's probably only one. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, oh, and it was Pam Althoff, so 
No, it's just, uh, actually, we're going to start with uh, Brian Hamer. Um, what tax reforms do you think are the most needed to uh, modernize our system, and, and how will that income tax revenue spike in April of uh, 2013 affect the fiscal, the coming fiscal, or the 2014 fiscal year? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot to cover there. Uh, let me just begin by saying that Greg, Craig's voice has been part of our family forever, and it's so neat to actually see the rest of you after all these years. Um, well, you, you use the word modernize, and I think uh, many of us in the room realize that that's something that needs to be considered. Just because a tax code has looked a certain way for many years doesn't mean that it should look that way forever, and, and, and particularly in a world that is rapidly changing. As I was preparing to come over today, I was just no noting all the different major revenue sources, tax sources in the state of Illinois that are under pressure for one reason or another, exactly because the world is changing. You, know, you have the sales tax, uh, where increasingly goods are becoming digital goods, something that the tax code did not contemplate uh, back when uh, it was written many years ago. There is the phenomenon of internet sales and uh, the, the point that has been mentioned on a number of occasions that uh, the economy is moving from tangible goods to services. Uh, there's the corporate income tax. Um, so in increasingly, as, as we all know, uh, global companies have become increasingly adept and aggressive about shifting income and expenses, meaning that the uh, income tax is increasingly less effective. Motor fuel taxes, uh, vehicles are becoming ever more efficient, um, and therefore the fuel tax is finding more trouble uh, funding transportation and, and, and other similar, similar needs. Uh, there's the individual income tax. Um, there, there's the point that uh, Senator Culler didn't really did not want to talk about, and we, we understand why, but the reality is that the population is getting older, and yet Illinois probably has the uh, most generous retirement exclusion uh, from the income tax in, in the country. And, and finally, there's the telecommunications tax. Uh, increasingly, uh, we or our family members are Skyping, and of course, <laughs> Skyping doesn't uh, uh, raise a charge and therefore doesn't generate telecommunications tax. So uh, across the board, uh, we're seeing over time the, the, the tax code that, that we've known uh, being unable to keep up with, with the economy. So I think my time is probably about up already, but you know, let, let me just say that uh, we need to be looking at closing corporate tax loopholes uh, to deal with a, an income tax on the corporate side that's increasingly failing. Uh, the governor has uh, proposed the closing of, of three income tax loopholes, um, and it's been very hard to get traction uh, to, to pass those. Uh, but uh, again, the, the, the fact is that as time goes on, uh, weaknesses in the tax code are identified and we need to be able to address those things. We need to be looking at digital goods and, and, and considering whether the, the sales tax needs to uh, evolve to deal with those. And we need to be looking hard at the flat tax. I, I noticed that in the materials that were distributed, there, there's a bar graph that shows how the, uh, the, the income of, of upper income uh, individuals in, in the state is growing substantially, whereas uh, that's not the case at the other end of, of the income scale. So unless you have more of a graduated or progressive income tax structure, the fact is that the tax system is not going to keep up to the state's needs. Um, and, and then just very briefly with respect to the other part of, of your question, the, uh, the so-called April surprise, probably the best bit of news that has come to my attention over the course of my 10 years in, in my current position, um, that will put some downward pressure on revenues in, uh, in fiscal year 14, but we're not yet prepared to say that that's going to require a change in our revenue estimates because there are countervailing forces at work. Uh, we're seeing strong capital gains, strong increase in the stock market, and, and also in, in dividends on the individual income tax side and on the corporate income tax side, strong corporate profits, maybe higher profits than we originally anticipated when we were working on, on the budget a number of months ago. Um, 
So it may well be that at, that at the end of the day, the, uh, the revenue stream pretty much ends up where we anticipated. It's still too early to say. I'll say that across the country, uh, states are experiencing similar things, and uh, to date there's, there's only one state that I know of that has reduced their fiscal year 14 um, revenue estimate in light of uh, this, the April surprise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Okay, Senator Hutchinson, uh, what role does uh, fiscal reform play in realizing your vision for the future of Illinois? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it, it's interesting that uh, Director Hamer brought up some of the individual things, so I'll speak globally because I think all things begin and end with the tax code. And so to say that we have a unworkable, antiquated, um, uh, what's another bad, but give me some, some a thesaurus for antiquated, but a tax code that is built, archaic, archaic um, but a tax code that's built for an economy that doesn't exist anymore. And because of that, it manifests itself in structural deficits every single year. We cannot continue, um, and I'm speaking as someone who has to run for office every cycle and that I know, I see people every cycle say, I'm running for the education of our children. I'm running so everyone has access to health care. I'm running so that we can turn the direction of this state around. You cannot do that if the one thing nobody ever wants to talk about because it elicits such strong emotions, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, if you cannot have a realistic conversation about taxes and about what taxes are there to do and about the fact that there is a massive disconnect between the taxes we pay and what those taxes are supposed to pay for. So when we think about what government ought to do, what, what, is, what role should government play, that is directly related to how we fund it so that we can do what it is constituents expect for us. When we were dealing with the budget this last cycle um, and we talked about increasing spending in education. Now, I'm not one of those people that every time someone says, you increase spending, that I see that as a bad thing. I don't, because I think investing in education is one of the smartest things we can do. We were facing funding education levels at 2003 numbers. So when we brought it up, we brought it up to 2008. Yay. It's 2013. And I need a state that's going to be ready to receive my children properly edu educated and ready to participate in the stream of economic activity that I hope Illinois is the fifth largest state in the country, sitting right in the middle of the country. If you go east or west or north or south, you're probably coming through here. There's a reason why when China came to visit, they didn't go to Sheboygan, they came to Chicago. Because of who we are in the Midwest and where we sit in the stream of commerce worldwide. So my view of fiscal reform is directly related to my view of what government ought to do in the first place. And it should be efficient, it should be transparent, it should be accessible, and it should be open to the people who need it the most. But more than anything else is that when you have no place else to go, when you have no one else to rely on, your government ought to be there for you. That ought to be a place where you can turn. We don't let people die in the street. We don't recognize in talking points that we are, we are competing on a global stage while we're educating for 20th century. We've got to educate our kids for the 21st century. We've got to create a tax code that works in the 21st century. We have to understand that as times change and demographics change and people change and, and demands change, we must be strong enough to change with it. So if that means looking at things like, why in the world would we give a tax credit to a state for, facility, for production activities they do in their state? Right now, Illinois gives a break because of our mirroring, because of our, our melding with the federal tax code. There was, in 2009, a tax, a tax break that was created to, to incentivize manufacturing. We all want to incentivize manufacturing, especially since we've lost that base here in Illinois and we've moved more to a service economy. The one sector that we really could afford to kind of, you know, boost or bolster and incentivize would be manufacturing. But when we did that at the federal level, through no action of the General Assembly, that means Illinois gives a break to multi-state companies who have production facilities in other states. So when you're creating jobs in Indiana and Wisconsin and Louisiana, we give you a break for it in Illinois friendly. We're such a wonderful place to do business. We'll give you breaks for what you do not even here. That alone was worth over $100 million. Now, am I wanting to fund my children? Or am I wanting to give tax breaks to, to production activities that don't even occur here? Those are things that we have to be honest about when we're talking about whether or not we're going to be able to turn the direction of the state forward. So 
when I'm listening to people run for office, when I'm listening to people give their reasons for why they're here, I know what you'll say to win. I'd like to see what you're willing to lose over. Thank you very much. No, no, no. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll let that mic work for the two guys on the end, and you guys share that one. Cool. Uh, all right. Um, so, uh, Chris Magnuson, uh, what steps would you recommend uh, the state take to improve the business climate in Illinois? Well, thank you, Craig, uh, for this opportunity. And first, let me apologize from our president, Philip Nelson, uh, who is actually farming today. You may all be aware that we've gotten a lot of rain this spring. Uh, and we are made up as an organization of farmers, family farmers. 94% of the farmers in the state are, are family farmers. And he's one. And when he has an opportunity to plant, he really has to do it. And so at about 8 o'clock last night, he called. And these talking points that I actually prepared for him with no idea I'd actually have to refer to them. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> he called and said, I feel really bad, but I have got to do this because the more rain's coming in. And so it's just a critical time for his business. So I'm going to actually try to read off my talking points. And uh, I'd say farmers are as committed to this state in terms of our business of, of maybe anyone because you can't pick up the land. Our president who's out farming today can't move that to Indiana or Wisconsin or anywhere else. Uh, they feel like they are committed, unlike any other business, to the long-term health of the state. We have a great state in terms of assets for agriculture. And by the way, Probably most of you didn't wake up this morning thinking we should invest in agriculture. That's the answer to our problems. But I would contend we should as a state. It's our largest industry. 25% of our workers are involved in some form of agriculture, not only farming, but if you look at manufacturers from John Deere to Navistar to Caterpillar to uh, our huge risk management through our Board of Trade and the Mercantile here in Chicago, uh, through just countless other types of processing industries, food processing, in, the, in this state, um, ADM and Decatur, et cetera, et cetera. It is a major um, you know, industry that I think often gets overlooked because we tend to think of ourselves bipolar. You know, We're Chicago or downstate, and one doesn't benefit the other. And in reality, that's not true. We, we, we share a lot in common, and that's my message overall uh, today. But I would say, um, so the business climate, um, when we got a group together called the Vision for Illinois Agriculture, which was made up of a variety of of businesses and agriculture, farmers, farm groups, uh, academia, state agencies, et cetera. Um, looked at our assets, yes, CTBA. Ralph's a great participant on that, um, and we very much welcome his, his, uh, his viewpoint. Um, and we looked at what Illinois has to offer, and it's really strong in terms of assets, like Senator Hutchinson mentioned. We were well positioned in the state. We have great transportation through our rivers, through uh, our rail system. We have access to the Chicago market. We actually have the richest soils in the country and, and some of the world. Uh, we just have everything going for us. But if we were not going to reach our potential, it's, we felt, because of two things in, in particular, a business climate that, um, at least in perception, lags much of the rest of the Midwest. And I can talk later if I get questions in that area about some of the things that make up that perception. Uh, and also attracting the best and brightest minds into agriculture. We need that talent. So we developed uh, the SMART Agenda, which has eight points uh, that we feel would make up a good business climate. And interesting, with all this discussion about taxes, you might think maybe a business-oriented group, it would have to do with lower taxes. Taxes are not mentioned of any of the eight items. They're really not the factors we heard when people talked about uh, what's important to a business climate. Uh, number one was operating with fiscal integrity, that, and we've heard that over and over again today. We've got to be able to pay our bills. We've got to you know, reduce our debt. We've got to operate within our budget. Uh, companies are not willing to invest and make a 50-year investment in a plant with a state that has that kind of uncertainty in terms of their fiscal situation. And then other things are, are areas in terms of a, a, a responsive regulatory, world-class education, support for startups. Um, Various types of, uh, of course, research, and that's another subject I could go in where, where Illinois is, uh, even though we're the largest state in the Midwest for agriculture, we're near the bottom on parallel with South Dakota and the amount of funds that the state provides to support agriculture research. So there's just a lot of things we could do to grow our economy through an improved business climate that we think uh, needs to be done. Thank you very much, Chris. <clears throat> 
And now, we have a two-part question for uh, Ralph Martiri. So you're saying two parts? But it's his playing field, his football. We, no, no, just kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, Ralph, first of all, what reforms do you think are most needed for the state to uh, resolve its deficit problems going forward? You know, it, it's pretty simple. There's no one magic silver bullet. In fact, at this point in my life, I'm tired of dodging silver bullets. There are, there are two things really the state has to do from a tax policy standpoint to get its fiscal house in order. And number one, it does have to expand its state sales tax base to include services. There are 46 states in the nation that have a sales tax. We have the fourth most narrow base because of our broad exclusion for services. Uh, that really costs us a significant amount of lost revenue over time and makes it almost impossible for state revenue growth from one year into the next to keep up with the inflationary cost growth of delivering services from one year to the next. So if your tax revenue is not growing at a rate that'll keep up with the cost growth in your services, you gotta cut them or you gotta do some irresponsible things, which the state has done in the past, borrow against the pensions to fund services. And second, we absolutely should go to a graduated rate structure for the income tax. We should design taxes in Illinois to be fair to track the ability to pay. And the only way to do that with the income tax is to have one where the rates get somewhat higher as incomes get higher, applying to those higher marginal rates to higher income levels. And really, and this was mentioned by Brian Hamer, but it's really very true. In America, since 1980, there's been a massive disconnect in income growth between most Americans and the wealthiest Americans. And I have to be clear, it is most Americans. Uh, over the sequence from roughly 1980 through 2007, so not even including the Great Recession, 90% of America only received 36% of all income growth. 90%, 30%, 36% of income growth. That means roughly two-thirds of all growth in income in America went to the wealthiest 10%. There's no way a flat income tax can fairly assess tax burden when that's the reality in the way income growth is distributed from your private sector economy. Now, as Senate President Cullerton mentioned, we do need to have a constitutional amendment to accomplish that goal, and I think that's a doable push it requires a lot of grassroots effort. It's gonna require a lot of public education, but I think at the end of the day, most people would be for a tax system that assessed tax burden in accordance with people's ability to pay. So I think it's a doable push, if a very difficult push. You know, we focus on the tax side of the ledger at, Il at CTBA for Illinois' problem resolution because it's very, very clear that spending on services is not driving the deficit. You'll see this number in your reports that are at, the de at your desk, but I really wanna emphasize it. We are spending, after you account for inflation and population growth, roughly 28% less on those four core services of education, healthcare, public safety, and human services today than we did at 2000. This is the fifth richest state in America, fifth largest economy. In fact, if we were an independent country, we'd have the 19th largest economy in the world. And yet we are scaling back our investment in everything from educating our children to caring for people with mental health concerns, developmental disabilities, to providing childcare to single working parents, to caring for abused and neglected children. It's outrageous what being fiscally bankrupt causes from a decision-making standpoint with the budget from a moral standpoint. So I think at this juncture, it being very clear that our revenues simply don't support our current level of services and our current level of services do not support our state's population, that we have to focus on the revenue side of the ledger. And I agree with the comments of Judy Bartopinka that it has to be a bipartisan effort and I am hopeful that we have Republican leadership in the state that will step to the plate and I even have examples of that happening. A couple of years ago, we were pushing a very large HB 750 tax increase for the state of Illinois would have expanded the sales tax base to services that included that family tax credit that John Cullerton was talking about, but we couldn't get it out of committee in the House on purely Democratic votes. And two Republican downstate legislators, Roger Eddy and Jerry Mitchell, who initially opposed the legislation because it was a tax increase, after seriously reviewing it and frankly working CTBA staff to death over a two week period of time, 
voted in favor of the bill against their caucus position, not because they liked it, they did not, but because they recognized it was the right thing to do. They were willing to lose over it. So I think we have that kind of leadership in both parties in Illinois, and it's now time for us to start activating the leadership to really move forward and resolve these issues. Well, let me uh, follow up with that because this is, we're going into a political season, as has been mentioned more than once here. What are the chances of seeing that kind of action this year and being able to pass either one of the things you talked about, either the expanded uh, uh, sales tax base or the graduated income tax? Well, the graduated income tax, you know, that requires a constitutional amendment. So it's a two-step process. Mm -hmm. First, the House and the Senate, by significant majorities, three-fifth majorities, have to vote to place it on the ballot. But it doesn't become law until we, as a body politic, also vote in favor of it. And, and I think it, even if you're a very conservative individual, whether you're in the Democratic or Republican Party, and you wouldn't support this approach to taxation yourself, you certainly have no reason not to vote in favor of a constitutional amendment because at the end of the day, your constituents are deciding how they want to be taxed. And I don't think any elected official ought to fear what their constituents really want. So I think that there's a sales pitch to make there, even to very conservative members. So I think that that has a chance. Uh, as far as the gubernatorial candidates taking it on, I think it all depends on whether or not they pay attention to history. So we have the lesson of an election with Governor Walker defeating the incumbent Dan Ogilvy years ago over the income tax issue. And Senator, uh, Governor Ogilvy was the advocate of the 1970 Constitutional Convention that created an income tax in Illinois. We didn't have one before then. And then he lost his reelection bid to a very populist Dan Walker who was charismatic and charming and a criminal. So everything we tend to support. <laughs> in governors. But what people don't look at is the deeper returns from that election. No state rep or senator who voted for that constitutional amendment and ran for re-election lost. And you can bet every candidate that ran against them used the issue. Walker defeated Ogilvy because of his personal charisma and charm. And, and we lay blame on the tax issue, but it really wasn't what drove that election. You fast forward to the first time Jim Edgar ran for the governorship against Neil Hartigan. Edgar ran as the pro-tax candidate. Governor Thompson had just temporarily increased the state's income tax from two and a half to three percent. Neil Hartigan, the Democrat, ran on a campaign of moving that tax increase back to two and a half percent. Jim Edgar said, we can't afford to do that. We have to make it a permanent tax increase. Edgar won the election. So, so at the end of the day, I think Senator Hutchinson put it best. I mean, we really have to be looking to support individuals that are, that are willing to tell voters and taxpayers not necessarily everything they want to hear, but what they have to hear and are willing to act on it. And I do think that that's a doable thing. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, although I may only ask one because we want to get a, have time to, for, for you all to uh, have a shot at these people. But... Um, and, and I'm going to throw this out to, uh, to Senator uh, Hutchinson first, but I want you all to get a piece of it. And that is to answer uh, Senator, or Senate President uh, Cullerton's question, which is, so what does the legislature do when that money stops? Or does it keep the, the money going when the, when the income tax is supposed to drop back down because right now we have we have people who have seen temporary quote taxes before and even he was pointing out yes we in the media keep referring to it as temporary wink wink taxes what happens when that due date comes one when we pass, I was one of the people who kind of felt like if we were going to do a quote unquote temporary income tax, we should have done it high enough to actually solve something. So to, to do a temporary income tax that still didn't solve, that didn't cover what it was we needed to cover, in addition to the fact that we did not refinance our backlog of bills. Now, I've heard it said a million times 
that you all passed an income tax increase. It was supposed to pay off all the old bills, and you didn't do it, and that's why we have a spending problem and not a revenue problem, failing to mention the fact that we did not refinance or restructure our debt. Now, I, for the life of me, cannot understand why it is acceptable to float the debt of the state of Illinois on the backs of people who do business with the state of Illinois. That is financing our debt on the backs of people who didn't give us permission to do it. That is fundamentally wrong and unfair and violates basic principles of contract law. So why we didn't refinance the debt is because we came down to a large political argument that was no borrowing. And because Illinois' problems are so big and so massive, when you distill them into one soundbite, no borrowing under any circumstances, as if your mortgage debt is bad or student loan debt is bad, or the fact that that debt is existing debt. We're not creating new debt, that's existing debt. That's debt that's not gonna go away. We have to handle it. Why we would not go to lenders who wanna lend us the money to pay our vendors who are owed the money is, un I don't understand that. So that's a one piece of the puzzle. When we get to the point where people realize that this income tax is about to go away, and what that means on the budget, what that means on those things that you ran for office swearing that you were gonna protect. Your schools, public safety, healthcare, human services. When they realize how significant that hole is, absent a serious change in the tax code for a different, you know, a progressive income tax, or that we close, I'm sitting here with a page right now, $696 million in loopholes we could look at. Off the set, there's 1.4 billion we could look at, because to the point that Ralph made earlier, we argue over appropriations, we pay absolutely no attention to the billions that go through the revenue code. No attention whatsoever. So that $100 million I talked about earlier is $100 million less going to education, $100 million less going to healthcare. And if we don't understand both sides of the ledger, because no business worth its salt can balance a books on only one side of the ledger, you have to look at both sides. So when people realize how significant that hole is, then we'll have a real conversation about whether or not that income tax is quote unquote temporary or not. So I think it's, it's time for truth telling in Illinois. Uh, anybody? Well, let me, let, me, let me come back to you. Sure. Because Brian, you, you raised a couple of issues that we haven't talked about uh, or that we don't talk about enough. The telecommunications tax is one, the uh, retirement benefits is another. Do we have to start looking at those things? And now I know you're speaking, you're, you're part of the administration, so you have to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think my point just is that um, both uh, the residents, the taxpayers of Illinois and, and public officials need to be looking at everything. Um, the, these are challenging times. I, I agree completely with Senator Hutchison that it's not just about one side of the budget. Um, in, in order to get our arms around uh, the fiscal challenges and also to meet our obligations uh, to, to people, particularly those in need in, in the state, we need to be looking at the spending side, but we also need to be looking at the revenue side. And to kind of have our blinders on and just say that because things have been this way in the past, they need to be this way going forward, it, it is really an invitation for uh, continuing fiscal crisis. Um, so yeah, we need to look at all these things and, and let's decide what makes the most sense. Okay. Chris. I was just gonna comment that uh, when the increase was passed, I think our membership, um, although there's always some who, who uh, never wanna see an increase in taxes, but I think they recognized, as others have mentioned, that it had to, you know, we have to look at both sides. Uh, I think that the suspicion that people have and fear is that uh, there won't be enough attention on reducing the expenses and this, and I think we heard that a little bit with uh, Comptroller Topinka when there was additional money. Uh, she was getting the question, where can we spend it without recognizing we have to pay off our bills? And so that, I think there's two things. If I could say our membership, first of all, you could probably win a lot of bets from people uh, if the income tax actually will revert back because most people uh, think temporary is uh, somewhat of a political gimmick and, and never see it actually recede. And the fear is, is there won't be a corresponding uh, attention to reduction in expenses, um, and that's that's a fear that I think a lot of people have. I hope that doesn't come to fruition, but that's a fear that I think a lot of people have. Okay, Ralph, and then we're going to take questions uh, from the audience right after that. So, 
be ready. Yeah, you should go to your reports analyzing the 2014 budget that was enacted. There's a chart in there showing you the impact of the temporary tax increase on the deficit. And what it clearly shows is that combined with the very significant spending cuts that have occurred, in fact, $4.7 billion in spending cuts in the last five years on public services, I would say that that's a relatively significant number of cuts. But combined with those cuts, that temporary tax increase has stabilized the state's deficit in the eight to $9 billion range. Before that temporary tax increase passed, we were looking at an accumulated deficit of almost $16 billion in the state of Illinois. If we didn't have that temporary tax increase, we made those $4.7 billion in service cuts, and we're still trying to spend at current levels for the 2014 proposed budget. And the chart is in there. Total expenditures on services in 2014 would be roughly $24 billion, and our accumulated deficit would be $34 billion. We'd have a deficit of about $10 billion more than our spending levels, which I think really highlights the fact that revenue is the one thing that has to be on the table to resolve the problems. We're all for that, what sounds like a canard in Illinois, living within your means, but in Illinois' case, we can't do that with our current tax system because our means simply don't support life. We have to find a tax system that works in the modern economy and can actually support those core investments the state makes in, once again, where nine out of ten dollars are spent, education, health care, social services, and public safety. Thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, Tracy Schoenberger has the, uh, has, is the microphone goddess, so you need to get her attention or mine in order to, uh, to speak, and we'll start there and then go to you. Uh, so I've heard a, ex a different explanation why uh, so much money, or the 80% didn't uh, participate in the prosperity from during the 80s. I've heard that, that uh, in wages, what you said is true, but in fringe benefits, especially health care costs, that's what really ate up anything that could be put on their wages. This just shows, this is in, the data sets that I am citing are internal revenue service data sets, share in growth of income over time. And what's remarkable about 90% of America only sharing in about 36% of the income growth from 1980 through 2007 is that the prior decades when we were building a middle class and we had more generous benefits, uh, the income distribution was flipped. And the bottom 90% got about 64, 65% of all income growth in America, again, according to internal revenue service returns, with the wealthiest 10% getting 36%. So there has been no spike in benefits payable to middle income and low income working families. In fact, their benefits have been reduced. Many in the private sector have been moved off a defined benefit system, and in fact, as far as health care coverage goes, the most recent data that we have, and it's a little old because there hasn't been an updated report yet, but as of about four years ago, 46% of the workers with a full-time job in Illinois did not get any health insurance offered to them on the job. 46%. So no, there's no hidden benefit wealth magnet out there for workers that's somehow skewing these numbers. What has truly happened is most Americans are not sharing in the economic growth in this country anywhere near where they used to share. And if you're designing your tax policy, you have to account for that and focus your tax burden on those who are paying from their growing wealth rather than those who are growing, gr paying from their growing poverty. Uh, this is a question for Senator Hutchinson. You'd mentioned uh, that uh, there are manufacturers who uh, get a tax benefit for uh, um, manufacturing not within our own state. How do we get rid of that? 
We put it in a bill. <laughs> um, we, we had a bill, we had a bill now, and we're gonna try to start really hitting um, hitting this from a grassroots level because it did go toward, we, in this bill we had about $445 million. We had three. One was foreign dividends, which is about $386 million, and that would allow Illinois to tax dividends that are earned by foreign companies and are transferred to companies that have taxable income in Illinois. So right now, they're considered taxable income under federal law, but they're exempt from Illinois taxation. $386 million. Foreign so anybody that you've ever heard run for office and say, I want to make sure that we don't send jobs overseas. Well, the way you incentivize that is to incentivize the financial practices that make it worthwhile for them to send it overseas. One thing we could do. The second thing, the domestic production credit. The biggest answer, the first answer to that is we need to decouple from the federal code. Right now, Illinois is one of, I think, only 22 states that are, that are coupled with the federal code. And there are folks who don't want us to separate. 22 states have done it because the best analogy I can come up with is it's, it's like being in the middle of a storm and it's rainy and it's windy and the, hill, the street is windy and you're telling me I can't steer. We have to stay, everything has to stay exactly the way it is right now. I can't steer to get out of this. We have to make our own decisions on our tax code based on the economy and the conditions as we find them in this state. And the only way to do that is if we're making our own decisions. That's why 22 states have decoupled from the federal code because we end up giving breaks and incentives through no action of the General Assembly, which continues the practice that we have in this state of tax policy as buckshot. We just shoot and hope it hits someplace and there's no policy that surrounds why we give an incentive, to whom we give an incentive, is it targeted, is it measurable, will we see a return on our investment and create a tax code that actually works for a 21st century economy. We cannot have a tax code built for 1913 in 2013. I have a question for Senator Hutchison. Uh, Senator Hutchison, uh, just to shift gears for a moment, uh, I'm concerned with the economic viability of uh, the south suburbs. Could you please elaborate on what the position is with the third airport? Yes, one of my favorite topics. And part of the reason it's one of my favorite topics is because when I first came in the General Assembly, I said, now that's a 40-year-old fight and I just turned 37. And a lot of smart people have been fighting about this for a long time and I just turned 37, so that's like almost my whole life. And so now I get to say that's over a 40-year-old fight and I just turned 40 and we just passed a bill to build a third airport. So finally, we, it appears we have all people swimming in the same direction. We know that for the South Suburbs, within 45 minutes drive time, there were 1.8 million people. 1.8 million people where development had, and economic investment has bypassed that part of the state. In my district alone, there are intermodals and rivers and uh, I passed legislation to create the Ileana Highway, which will be the first east-west highway built in this part of the state since I-80. So when you add the Ileana and the airport and the three intermodals and the cargo capacity for the economic activity that happens amongst 1.8 million people within a 45 minute drive time, now we're talking about investing in the transportation infrastructure network of a part of the state that sorely, sorely needs it. In 1984, the FAA said Chicagoland has to find another site to relieve what we know is gonna be the coming pressure now I know that most of the stuff I buy is online and I get it shipped to my house. That means it goes from some warehouse, goes on a plane or on a train, and then a truck, then changed to a truck and delivered to my door. The way our commerce moves now tells us that we have a real shot at some economic development in the South Suburbs. So I'm very, very pleased, very pleased that after decades and decades and decades, representatives from Will County and Kankakee County and Cook County came together and invested in us, so I'm, I'm, it's a, it was an exciting day on the last um, day of session. So we have a shot, but we only got one time to do it right, so this is just the beginning, not the end, just the beginning. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. This is gonna be our last question, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to Mr. Martiri, our host. There's only been a couple mentions of health care. I think somebody said that 46% of workers were not offered it at work. Isn't that about to change with the Affordable Health Care Act? And will Illinois be ready by the October 1st, which I think is the October 1st deadline for the so-called um, marketplace or exchanges? 
And, and I also keep hearing that people will be able to choose from various plans online, but aren't most people who would benefit from um, this healthcare expansion not um, the type of people that would have computers in their homes to look online in order to find these um, choices? And how will that affect the overall budget? I realize that's three questions, but it kind of, they all kind of fit together. You cheated. Are you guys ready for implementation? No. That's what I thought. No. That's what I thought. Ralph, Ralph just said, are you guys ready for implementation? I said, no. <laughs> we, we are behind. We're behind. You know, and part of that was wrapped up in the political um, arguments as to whether or not um, the Affordable Care Act was going to be struck by the Supreme Court. So there was a contingency of folks in Illinois that didn't want to put down any of the markers that we needed to put down to have our health care exchanges ready for implementation in 2014. I think we're trying now to figure out, one, um, with the federal government's um, promise to pay 100% of new enrollees in, in Medicaid as a result of that, and then going forward after that, 90% of that, what that means to our Medicaid budget here. And while we're having these conversations, we are still stuck in the who's eligible to be on Medicaid in the first place. So um, th it's going to be a, a bumpy road in that um, people who understand that uh, for the poorest of the poor, uh, we cannot erode the safety net that happens because you pay more for that in the end. You, you just, it, it doesn't make sense for us to pay three times the cost when we can try to do everything we can to get people um, proper coverage now so that they can have primary care visits. They don't present in the emergency room, which is again three to four times the cost of that. They're not stuck in a mire of unnecessary tests and unnecessary um, procedures when you're getting regular coordinated care along the way. Um, what, what we're finding now is that in the, and remember what I said earlier was, what's the role of government? What ought government do? What are, we, what are we charged with doing? And in that, we're having a conversation as to what role the states should play in our healthcare coverage. The interesting thing about that, though, is that for those people who argue states' rights, you'd think you'd want people to come in and have Illinois design a system that works for Illinois instead of turning it over to the federal government if we don't do it. So um, there's, there's a lot of working groups that are dealing with that. I don't know that we've had a whole lot of conversations about the digital divide, like people who would be most apt to use this. But I will say that the most poor of us are, will still have Medicaid. We're trying to deal with people who would have coverage if they could afford it. These are the working poor with no benefits. These are people who you know, were single and, di and, and didn't have children, which we're now covering. These are folks who are participating in the economic stream. They do, they, they have smartphones, they have other things. They just can't necessarily handle $5,000 deductibles on their care. So I don't know that the um, digital divide is gonna be as significant in that population of folks, because these are people who, you know, you know, but if there is a, a problem with that, we're, we'll have to make a little um, buttonhole note to make sure that that's something we look at. Right now, I think it's more about the policy direction that we're gonna go in as to who should be in this and who can we move out of the Medicaid roles and onto being fully covered or at least covered in a way that they can afford it. Thank you very much. And I would like us all to thank our panel this afternoon. This has been really in Brian Hamer, Toy Hutchinson, Chris Magnuson, and Ralph Martiri. It's been a real pleasure for me and so much of a pleasure that I'm gonna tell you that uh, excerpts of this, uh, this panel and in fact even uh, some of the remarks of our keynote speakers are going to be part of our uh, at issue program on Sunday uh, on WBBM so uh, you'll get to hear some of it again but uh, anyway thank you very much for uh, your good questions and for your keen attention Ralph back to you Well, I, I want to thank everyone again who came, uh, the staff, our directors, our committee, our sponsors, our wonderful panelists and your great insights. And, and end with some questions. I want you to think of a word to describe a state. It's a state that has great wealth, yet has consistently underfunded the education it provides children, so much so that it ranks at or near the bottom in every category 
of investing in its kids. On top of that, this same state sees a differential in funding for its children of color vis-a-vis -vis its majority white children that is the greatest in the nation. This is coming at a time when economic viability is more closely correlated with your educational attainment than at any other time in our history. And what would you use to describe a state as a word that has consistently, over the last decade, cut its investment in caring for people with developmental disabilities, mental health problems, child care for single working parents, domestic violence prevention and treatment, despite having great wealth? And what word would you use to describe a state that was trying to balance its budget on the backs of retirees, teachers, and other state workers who have modest pensions because it's unwilling to deal with tax policy. And here's the kicker. What word would you use to describe a state that is letting a net tax increase, and we've run these numbers, of about $5 billion, which is less than 1% of our state economy, stand between it and resolving all these problems. There's a lot of different adjectives you could use, but the one that works the best is Illinois. <laughs> it is the state of Illinois. We don't have to accept this at vo as voters and taxpayers. And in fact, we have some fantastic leadership in both parties, you heard some of it today, that is willing to move our state forward. All it requires is us supporting them in that effort. I look forward to working with everyone in this room in making the difference needed to change tax policy so that Illinois can fund a viable future. Thank you very much.